Our gospel for this Sunday in Lent comes to us from the 12th chapter of the gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, as, you know, parts of Lent, we've been kind of hopscotching through John. This, just to give some context, this is right after what would be the Palm Sunday lesson for John. He's just entered into Jerusalem in triumph, and there is this conversation that happens. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world, that the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Now, I ha- you know, people know that I have this tendency towards <clears throat> particular type of humor, but it actually is well-researched in what I do because I realize that it actually has a value added to it in many ways because I've noticed that since I started sharing these puns, my audience has doubled in size. Now, remember, dad jokes are, you know, there's rules about dad jokes. One... They have to be matured, so that way they are full grown. And if you are, you know, if you try to tell these jokes and are not a parent, well, then it's just a faux pas. All right, I'll stop with that line and people are going, oh my gosh. But I, you know, one, and just for the record, some of those, some of you shared with me, so just... (laughs) Let's be clear here, folks, okay? You know, you feed the beast, there you go. A friend of mine sent me this one. I I thought this was cute. There's a church in Wisconsin that changed from using bread and wine at communion. Being in Wisconsin, they wanted to be more contextual, so they used cheese and milk. And they don't have to consecrate the elements. They just pasteurize them. And see, and let's face it, folks, Wisconsin, America's dairy land, is the home of fast food because it's pasteurized before you know it. (laughs) I know. It's actually a reason why I do this. You know, it's not for the humor or comedic value, that's for sure, because most of you are going, ay, they. It's because it causes you maybe for a moment to take a deep breath even if it's a sigh or a groan, it might cause you to take a moment and laugh just a little bit and let go. But also, puns and all of that stuff are plays on words. Words are important. Words is how we convey meaning and importance. Think of the way we use words and the words that you choose to try to tell someone something. It's important that we're mindful of our words. And oftentimes, we might hear someone use words in such a way that you go, to quote a favorite movie of mine, I, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Name the movie. Thank you. There's a couple. Eight o'clock just looked at me and went, what? Oh, people, please. You're killing me. But how often 
do we hear words, or sometimes we say things, and it's like, oh, no, 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 that's not what I mean. And it's of infinite, infinite important to us in the, our lives of faith because we speak and we describe Jesus as the Word. In fact, the Word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It's important for us to pay attention to words. And there's a word in the Gospel of John that gets played a lot that I think is one of those words that we use and we don't see it. We, don't, we, we, we miss it. Jesus describes the manner of his death as being lifted up. And that's how God's glory was going to be revealed. He told that to Nicodemus in last week's gospel lesson. The, the, the glory of the Lord is me getting lifted up. Lifted up? Let's again remember, what's glorious about being hung on a cross? That's the glory of the Lord? Are you joking me? That's glory? Well, again, we might be struggling with language here. So I decided to, uh, as, you know, as they used to say, look this up in your funk and wagnalls. Really, this was in the Oxford English Language Dictionary. So I went to the source. Glory is a noun. It's high renown or honor won by notable achievements. Magnificence or great beauty. As a verb, it's to take great pride or pleasure in. Think about that defi those definitions and now contemplate the cross. Anybody see that there seems to be some difference? What's magnificent about being hung from a cross? What's great honor about being stripped naked, beaten repeatedly, and hung out to die between two common thieves? This is a heck of an accomplishment, isn't it? This is glory? This is God's glory? Again, perhaps we may be mistaking things or using it in a different way. Because to us, normally, glory is things that we achieve, attain, some award or recognition, something you work very hard for. Here's this degree. Here's this job. Here's this, you know, you're an Eagle Scout. You're a Gold Star. You've attained a certain thing. You've attained living in a particular zip code or buying a particular car or house. You have a particular thing that your children do that you take Great pride in. Or, you know, who your spouse is. Or anything else like that. You tend to glory in things that you attain or achieve. What's glorious? What did he attain or achieve? What was so magnificent about that? That's part of the life of faith, to contemplate what that means. If the cross is central, what does it mean? But sometimes we don't want to even think about it. Sometimes, there, I mean, there are Christian groups that just don't want to. Or what they do is they become something where you can go to Barnes & Noble and get, there's a whole section at Barnes & Noble, Christian self-help. Because what's God about? You winning, you victory, you attaining that house in that particular zip code, that job, that job title, that award, that activity, that attainment. That's God. And so what happens if that doesn't happen? Sorry, you missed. But how often does faith then become this quest that's about you? You need to find Jesus as if he's the one that's lost. You need to accept Jesus into your heart as if somehow you can lock the door. 
You have to say the right kind of prayer in order to know you're saved. A.K.A. you must attain. You must achieve. The glory of the Lord is yours to grasp, to earn. I do not think it means what you think it means. Notice one very important thing in the wording here. You might have heard some wording in this gospel lesson of John that sounds familiar from other gospels where Jesus talks about deny yourself and follow those who love their life and those who hate their life. In every other gospel but this one, there's one line that they add take up your cross and follow. Notice in the Gospel of John, he doesn't say you have to take up a cross and follow, he just says follow. Does that mean he's hoarding all that glory for himself? Or do we forget the purpose of the cross and what God's glory is really about and the glory that we are invited to be a part of and to share is about? As Jesus explained to Nicodemus, the glory of the Lord is him going to be lifted up on this cross. Why? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. He didn't go to the cross to go, look at me. It wasn't a fun place to be, regardless of the Monty Python song in one of their movies. It wasn't about him. For God so loved the world. And in case we miss it, again, notice the setup for this. Some Greeks, Gentiles, come up and say, we want to see Jesus. Those people? Those others? Those foreigners? Those heretics? Those foreign devils and demons? Those people? Yes. Because why? For God so loved the world, yes, the world, the whole world. Not just my little part of it. That God's love is shown and the grace and mercy comes out. What we see when we look to the cross is amazing grace and unconditional love that is proclaimed for all the world. As he said, I will draw the whole world to myself. Why? Through what? Coercion? Fear? You better or you miss? No. For God so loved the world. It's grace. It's grace. We don't attain it. We don't earn it. Heck, we don't even really deserve it. But that's what the glory of the Lord is about. Me, God giving these things. Not him saying, well, if only, or when, that love comes to you. Grace is given to you. The gift of new life is yours. Why? Because that's the glory of the Lord. There's a lot of conversation in John about light and dark and everything else like that. One of the things to remember, again, is in our baptisms. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The light isn't for you going, hey, look at me. It's to see these things that you do for others. As Martin Luther puts it, God doesn't need your good works. Your neighbor does. So we live in grace. And that's the glory of the Lord. And so I invite you, during this season, you know, this Holy Week, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and it's often easy to just go, well, I'll come on Palm Passion Sunday, and then I'll come on Sunday, and then Easter Sunday. I really invite you to come to Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday for those lessons and those actions and those experiences that might just give you a little more of an understanding of what really this is about. They didn't just come and die and rise. 
that the glory of the Lord is far more. It's about love that's proclaimed, grace that is extended, a gift for you, for the whole world. And so I invite you to come and nurture and nourish those things as we try to wrestle with what does it mean to follow this one who proclaimed love for the whole world. And remember that God loves you, and so do I. Amen.